Okay, so before I start, um, I would like to acknowledge that I am currently located in what is now known as New Westminster, BC, and which is on the traditional ancestral territories shared by 10 different nations. And I like to highlight the uh, Kikite Nation, which is the only Canadian nation without a permanent land base. And as we are located in our homes, you might want to take a look at this resource that I quite like, nativeland.ca, to search for your own um, postal code and you can find out more about whose lands you are located on and the history of uh, some of those nations. Okay, so I am, um, my name is Jens. I'm an educational consultant at the CTLT and I will co-moderate the session with Will. And um, Will, do you want to quickly pipe up, introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Will Engel. I'm a strategist for open education initiatives uh, with the CTLT as well. All right. And we will be in the session with our four panelists, uh, Cole, Cole, Georgia, Calith, and Sylvester. And you can just go ahead and introduce yourselves in that order. Hi, everybody. My name is Cole Evans. I have the uh, fortunate privilege of being president of the AMS EBC Vancouver, and it's great to be here today. Hi, baby. Yes, and Hi, if you, baby. sorry, <laughs> do you want Hi, to share your uh, area of study and year as well? Sure. I always sorry. forget that I'm a Hi, student. I'm a student too. <laughs> I, I work all the time, so I'm like, oh, I actually also attend this school. Um, but uh, I am a political science student with doing a minor in history as well, and I, this is my fourth year at UBC. Hi everybody, my name is Georgia. I'm the AMS Vice President of Academic and University Affairs. Um, I go by she, her pronouns, and I am a fourth year student studying biology with a minor in health and society. It's nice to see you all here today. Hey folks, I'm Kalith. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm a settler scholar calling in from the traditional ancestral enunciated territory of the Musqueam people. Um, I serve as the AMS VP External Affairs, mainly doing a lot of work surrounding government uh, related advocacy. Um, I'm also a fourth year political science student and I've got one more year left until I hopefully end my degree. Hi everyone, I'm Sylvester Mensa, the current AMS Vice President of Administration. Um, I'm in my final year, I'm in my final year here at UBC. Um, study in international economics and the Bachelor of International Economics program over at the Vancouver School of Economics. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and definitely looking forward to our discussion. All right, welcome to our panelists and uh, we are appreciative of your time and thank you for agreeing to be here and share your experiences. And I will hand off the mic to Will. Great. I, I do just want to second that. I really appreciate uh, our panelists being able to take time. Not only is it, um, as always, a busy time this semester, AMS elections are currently underway. So there's a lot happening for the AMS. Um, if you're a student who's not currently elected, please go out and vote. Um, don't, don't miss your opportunity to, to um, participate in AMS elections. Um, so it is coming up on March 2021, and we're about almost a year into um, the change to remote um, teaching and remote learning. Um, can you describe a positive surprise? We've heard a lot of the negatives, I think, or experienced a lot of the negatives, but have you just, um, can you describe a positive surprise you've encountered in online uh, learning, I would say within this term or within the, the last year? Yeah, no, thank you very much for that question. Um, uh, I'd like to kind of share my input on that. So I've, I'll say I've definitely been taking online classes for the past four terms as everyone else. Um, but for me, I think um, the, the, the big positive for me is the amount of resources being saved. Um, and by resources, this goes from time to money to energy, um, because now um, in this online environment, I do find it that um, I do have a, a better opportunity where I'm in more control of the pace at which I study. Um, being able to adjust, um, I guess, material um, at a healthy pace that allows me to excel. Um, but also with online school, I do realize that um, I realized the amount of time that was being wasted just getting to class or just trying to have an education. Um, and now um, with the comfort of being able to, to study from literally anywhere, um, I do believe there's a huge positive when it comes to being able to have a more comfortable learning environment. Um, as well as opening more opportunities for, you know, further experiences and engagement to beyond just academics. Um, and just to speak on my current um, work commitment. So 
um, as a full-time staff in the AMS, um, I, I really do not know how I would have been able to balance school and work um, if I wasn't taking school online. Um, but now I do have the ability to kind of switch in and out of both, um, allowing me to also do more um, than just working full-time and having a kind of full-time course load. Um, so for me, I would say kind of um, major positive saving resources, um, which also opens the door for so many more experiences that students um, often overlook um, on campus, given the kind of um, demanding um, course loads that um, we have here at UBC. Hey, thanks. Can, can you give an example of a, maybe an unexpected specific personal challenge that you feel comfortable sharing related to, to teaching or sorry, learning online? Yeah, for sure. I can take that on. Um, so throughout the semester, I've been actually recovering from a concussion, which sucks on its own. But when you're staring at a screen for hours and hours on end in this Zoom world, I, I'm sure that we can all relate to the Zoom fatigue. It's definitely been compounded. Um, so I've I'm personally registered with the Center for Accessibility. Um, and so one of the best ways of, being, of having to coordinate with um, my instructor and reaching out to my instructor um, has been that um, additional support. But I think it's also been so incredibly meaningful when instructors and TAs also reach out to students when they notice, hey, something's up, um, like a student isn't handing in their assignments or isn't showing up to class. So I think that that's been one of the biggest pieces of, you know, when instructors are reaching out and checking in, like, how is it going um, and being accommodating. Um, and I think that there's also um, something to note about a lot of these students out there that aren't as familiar as with navigating structures at UBC, like the Center for Accessibility or academic concessions policies, for example. So I think it's really meaningful to be able to reach out to um, the to um, these students. But I'm really grateful the for the compassion that my instructors have granted me and um, different assignment deadlines and everything. So, Georgia, if you don't mind me drilling into that a little bit, can you can you give a sort of example of of how you've engaged with like a teaching team in one of your courses around um, around having this accommodation or needing more accommodations? Yeah, I definitely think that it's been um, a process of being able to reach out to the instructor and kind of like being able to chat more one on one about, hey, this is the nature of what I've been going through. Um, and also being able to um, connect like, oh, these are the realistic deadlines for which I'm able to get things in on, um, or these are the different things that we can kind of mark so that we're able to catch back up to speed as well. Um, and kind of what is the nature of the current work that is being, um, being placed in front of um, a student as well. Thank you. And Jens, I'm gonna turn it back over to you for the next question. All right, thank you, um, Will, for turning it over. And uh, thank you again, Sylvester and Georgia, for sharing your personal experiences. Um, I'm now even more appreciative of your time, Georgia, having, knowing about the, your challenges with Zoom, um, above and beyond all of our challenges. So let's spend some time talking a little bit about some specific um, kind of course design and lesson design aspects of online learning. And we've known even before the whole um, COVID pivot and online teaching that student engagement in large classes has been challenging. And it's been a challenge for both students and instructors. And maybe now it might even be more so there's new tools. So if you could just um, provide us with some examples of something that you think instructors are doing that works well for you to create inclusive interactions and motivate your engagement with, with your fellow students in this online environment. Yeah, totally, I'd, I'd like to take that. Um, I think uh, breakout rooms have become a staple in online learning, at least based on my experience. And we've all been there, the awkward breakout room, you're, you're in a room with uh, four or five other people from your class. Some people have their cameras turned off, most of them are muted and you're just staring at each other awkwardly, not, not sure what to say. And um, you know, that's, that's something that we, I've seen so often in my online um, learning environment, but something that stood out 
to me recently in one of my courses was project-based learning and incentivizing that through collaboration in the form of breakout rooms. And one of my instructors, um, it's, it's a very, the, the course I'm taking is, is a poly 308. It's a very um, course heavy, um, I guess, uh, structure to the class where we're all divided into small groups and we're all focusing on a project that's, 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 that's what we're working on for the entire semester. And that will, and how we work is the, the classroom is essentially divided into breakout rooms and we're, we're supposed to work to work together with that breakout room and, and work on a, a project. Um, and I think that's worked really well where we have that incentive to really work together and work beyond just the classroom environment as well and collaborate online and using other systems to uh, using other platforms to make this uh, possible is very helpful as well. And Notion, for example, is something that my instructor use, uses that that allows us to collaborate quite a bit online. Um, it's kind of like Google Docs, just a bit more. Um, there's a lot more features on it and helps a lot with collaboration. And I think that's I think instructors need to um, use breakout rooms as a, as a tool to encourage um, collaboration and I, and I know that's the purpose and that's the purpose it serves and that's it works most of the time but um, in order to avoid those awkward conversations I think there needs to be a much more clear incentive before being sent into those breakout rooms um, and that's definitely something that's worked really well um, in my experience so far. Thank you, Khaled. And maybe maybe feeding off the, uh, the idea of that clear incentive, is there anything your instructor did in that course to sort of set up the environment within your group of students to really become comfortable in working together as a team in those breakout rooms? And maybe um, something that other instructors could adopt. Yeah, so. no, for sure. There, there's a lot of self-direction involved um, where we essentially had to work with the instructor to choose uh, which area in that course that we'd like to focus on and what exactly our project will look like. And I think you know, this online environment has pushed us to be a lot more innovative and think outside the box. Because for example, if I'm giving a presentation in front of my class, um, you know, we're, I'm stuck to just sharing my screen and then speaking over it. And, uh, and giving that freedom, especially during times like this, for us to go above and beyond and really think outside the box on how to make a presentation or a project much more collaborative and much easier to present in, in this environment, I think goes a long way. Um, and I think that starts with the instructors acknowledging that things are not the same and there might, there's a lot of room for improvement and there's a lot that needs to be changed and really involving students in that conversation and seeing what works best. And that's something I think my instructor did really well is understanding what platforms we'd like to use. Um, for example, we dabbled with Microsoft Teams um, for the first few weeks of the class and students made it very clear that, you know, this is not something that works for us. We'd rather stick to breakout rooms and the way you're doing breakout rooms is great and act, do our actual work on Notion itself. So really involving students in those conversations has gone a long way. I mean, we're, we're used to the traditional uh, mass lecture hall learning and that's worked for us for many, many years. And that's a very traditional system that was you know, built off of times that were much more different than we are now. And these days we're seeing students come up with various solutions for some problems that instructors uh, may not may not have answers to and I think that collaboration goes a long way and that's something I like to advocate for and push for is is collaboration between instructors and 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 students and um, you know shortening that gap and I must say too the 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 online environment has made it somewhat easier for a lot of students to actually have conversations with their instructors. Um, you know, for example, on Zoom, there's a very helpful tool where you can you can call the instructor to your own breakout room and have those conversations with them. And I think, you know, for example, for students that um, may not be so comfortable speaking to an instructor in person, um, this is speaking to your instructor through a screen is, is much less nerve wracking to a lot of people. At least that's, that's, a, that's the case for me. Um, so I think uh, something I would really emphasize is collaboration between instructors and students to find solutions to problems that, that have come out of this new environment that we're all in. Thank you, Kenneth. Yeah, I do hear that um, emphasis on shared decision making and giving up some agency to the students in the classroom. And thank you for sharing your um, insights on what worked well with um, breakout rooms. And through our kind of previous conversations, um, just before we started, I know Cole was going to talk a little bit about his experience with breakout rooms. So maybe I'll get Cole to share some insights as well. 
Sure, thanks, gents. Um, you know, I, 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 probably a similar sentiment to Cal as far as breakout rooms go. I mean, it's uh, I was I was thinking about it, and it's it's the it's very. I mean, like we're let's be real, real. We're sitting in a lecture hall. You know, whether you have 100, 200, 300 people, and you know what we usually see faculty do very frequently is um, sometimes we'll say, okay, you know, turn to the people beside you or turn to the people around you and you know discuss you know this for five minutes and then let's you know come back and talk about it um which is you know relatively effective in person um you know you're kind of forced as a student to do that or else you <laughs> or else it's pretty clear to the to the to the faculty member that you're not doing anything because you're just sitting there um but with with breaker room is a lot different because um sort of like Calis said there's no um, there's no guidance uh, in breakout rooms, so it's very easy, and we see this probably in, I don't know, I, I, in every single breakout room I've been in, I've seen this. I don't know what the actual data is on this, but uh, in the many breakout rooms I've been in, there's always at least one or two people in that group of four or five uh, students that cameras off, mic off, you know, that is not contributing to conversation at all. Um, you know, sometimes people will, before their professor goes into the breakout room, will leave the Zoom call um, so they don't have to go into a breakout room. And then they will then, you know, come back after, you know, five minutes down the road once the breakout room has been done. So, you know, and I think that, like, obviously trying to facilitate, like, um, you know, student conversation is important. Um, and, you know, that sort of peer learning that, that you know, we want to see. Um, but, you know, I, I think that, you know, it really depends on like what the breakout rooms are being utilized for. Um, you know, I've been in situations where, you know, the professor's like, okay, like go in a breakout room and like, you know, solve this question. Um, usually what we, what I've seen anyway as well with that is you usually have one student that's solving the question and you might have a lot of passengers in that breakout room that are just going to sit there so they can get the answer to the question and they can then go on to whatever intake you're using, whether it's iClicker or, uh, canvas or, um, or whatever, and then just, you know, type in the answer. So, you know, I, I would say that breakout rooms are probably going to be a bit more effective when, you know, you just have a chance to, um, have open discussion. Um, you know, not necessarily that there's like, a, Oh, you go in your breakout room and do this together and work on it together. Um, but like, you know, just have a chat. Um, but I also think that that's something that you could also just bring into, um, your, your core group as well with your core, with your course. Um, like Cal have said, I think a lot more people are sometimes a bit more comfortable engaging, um, you know, through a video camera rather than in a massive lecture hall. So it, it's, a, it's a tough question to answer because, um, you know, I, I think that you, you encounter a lot of the same um, issues um, that you do as trying to encourage students to participate. Um, but of course, without that guidance, you know, it's hard to, you know, keep students accountable to participating, if you will. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, similar to what Cal said, I think for me, like, you know, guidance is important, you know, um, coming up with clear, um, you know, objectives for students that they know what they're talking about. Um, and also, I think maybe not necessarily um, over utilizing breakout rooms either, because I think that we, you know, sometimes see some fatigue with, okay, like, you know, now I'm I'm in the course and I have to go with a random group of students and people who I don't know and talk to them for five minutes. And I don't know these people. So why do I want to talk to them? Um, which is the unfortunate reality of a lot of these situations. So it's, it's definitely a tough task. And, but uh, I, I think there's definitely ways that we can you know, find a, find a good balance. Thank you, Cole. And um, so think kind of taking off the idea of, of balance and, and guidance, is there a sort of a sweet spot in terms of providing um, structure, kind of the balance between structure and flexibility in the online course design, now beyond just breakout rooms, but in terms of the entire course, um, in, in terms of being flexible with students. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and I think that this year we've seen faculty has been, you know, you know, really quite good at adapting to what has been a crazy year, and you know, quickly modifying. Uh, their core structures to, you know, accommodate for online learning. Um, but like a big uh, gap um, that I think a lot of students have noticed and a lot of students have been talking about is professors are really good at, at doing that for the local environment for their course. But sometimes a lot of these, um, you know, 
course designs are great for if you're doing one course and they're, you know, they're good for, you know, continuous um, assessment and they're good for, um, you know, ensuring that students stay engaged with material, but it doesn't work as well when a student's doing a full course load and they're doing four other courses on top of it that also have weekly quizzes and then also have bi-weekly short essay response papers due. Uh, it ends up actually creating more workload for students at the end of the day um, when the intent of the individual faculty member is, you know, to lessen the overall stress in the specific course. So I think that when we're talking about online learning, a, a way that we can, you know, a find a good balance is, you know, take what works good about online learning. So, you know, having, you know, educational resources, super accessible for students, um, you know, the asynchronous, you know, element as well, where lectures are posted. And so students can look at them on their own time. They don't necessarily have to attend their live, um, you know, the ability to do um, sort of these small check-in sort of type assessments. Um, but so that's all great. And that works, you know, super well for a lot of people, I think. But I think that it's also important for faculty to, you know, be cognizant of, you know, that this exact sort of, you um, you know, the same sort of um, structure being used in probably four other courses. So, and I think that, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to completely adjust our um, course structure, um, but it could mean that maybe we're a bit more flexible with things like deadlines, you know, maybe we're, you know, we're being, a, you know, instead of having a quiz that's due at a hard deadline, you know, every single, you know, week at a certain time, maybe there's just, you know, a more flexibility of when you complete the quiz, if the point of the quiz is really just to learn things. You know, so like what are these little tweaks that we can make to you know, sort of alleviate that stress on the students that, you know, have all these sort of like micro assignments here and there um, that they have to manage now, rather than, you know, maybe in a normal year where you have a midterm, a final exam, or, you know, you have a one term paper and then maybe a couple of other assignments that you now have three times as many assignments for the course. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm just looking at the time and I think um, we have, and I, I also noticed a few questions from the audience. We'll have some qu time for questions from the audience at the end. So maybe we'll move forward from online learning to online assessing, if I may. And um, so online learning has changed the way assessments are conducted and different instructors have adopted different strategies um, to assess student learning. Some provided some flexibility as well, maybe some, um, non-traditional strategies so is there anything that stood out to you that worked really well um yeah no i'll just like to um just kind of piggyback of, of on one of Khaled's points concerning kind of creating assessments that encourage more collaboration within the classroom um i do realize that there is a big shift from kind of secondary education to kind of post-secondary education when it comes to what the the main kind of focus of the instructor is. Um, I do realize that, you know, a lot of the time in high schools, teachers are making an effort to ensure that the students within the classroom have a relationship amongst themselves. Um, and I do know that, you know, in university with larger classrooms, you know, professors don't necessarily have um, the, the ability to do so. Um, but I do think, you know, there could be some sort of happy medium there where professors or educators are, you know, actively seeking ways to, um, create relationships within the student body. Um, whereas, you know, given students opportunity to interact with one another, um, this can definitely happen through kind of project-based work, um, through kind of peer reviewed assessments, or even kind of continuous learning with discussions um, of that sort. Um, because I think, you know, the reason why, you know, you're in a breakout room and people find it awkward or are not able to conversate is because they probably don't know each other already. Um, and I think if that's a, a habit that is being um, kind of built throughout their academic course load, um, individuals will no longer feel, you know, hesitant to engage once they're put in an online environment like that. Um, so for me, I think, you know, things that have worked out the, the best for me um, have been more so project-based learning um, that not that also evaluate my understanding of the subject matter, but also rely on my ability to kind of um, address it to kind of real life scenarios. Um, and also, I, I know that there's a huge um, issue when it comes to, um, I guess, assessments and ensuring that, you know, students are actually putting their work out there and not necessarily kind of 
piggybacking of others or like cheating for that matter. Um, and I think to, to address that, um, it may be the question of potentially having more kind of continuous learning assessment. So um, if it's a case that, you know, you, you, have, an you have a class that is um, really dense content wise, um, potentially having kind of weekly quizzes, weekly discussions, um, something that um, kind of speaks to the student's ability to kind of continuously engage with the material. Um, I think that way there'll be less pressure being placed on um, kind of in time assignments, which would probably um, require some sort of um, remote proctoring, which hopefully would not be the case. Um, but yeah, I do think kind of project-based learning um, and also having more kind of continuous learning assessments um, may be kind of the direction where we, we hopefully should be switching to um, with online school and also moving past this time. Yes, thank you for sharing this, Celestia. It'll be interesting to see how those um, shifts might take hold in the um, face-to-face -face classroom once we move on. Maybe um, building off your um, brief notions of proctoring and um, kind of concerns around cheating or piggybacking. Um, were there some things, uh, what, are some, what are your experiences with different approaches to proctoring? Was there something that might've worked, something that really didn't work for you? Yeah, there's been a lot of different concerns raised um, by students around so, uh, algorithmic proctoring software like Proctorio. Um, I think it's really notable that um, a lot of these algorithmic remote invigilation software like Proctorio, they don't really um, reinforce academic integrity. It's often um, very easy to just put your phone to the side. But I think there's also been a lot of different equity concerns, such as it not um, recognizing darker skinned students' faces um, or incompatibility with um, with um, disability um, uh, assistive mechanisms or um, flagging students with disabilities as well. Um, so I'm, I'm really like, I'm gonna agree with Sylvester here um, and really commend the different ways that um, instructors have redesigned assessments to be project-based um, and really encourage students to reflect on their own learning um, rather than having to go to websites like Chegg or to share things in a group chat um, or share answers in a group chat um, that really encourages them to reflect on, um, on their own learning and how they are like also um, creators of, and recipients of knowledge as well. Um, so I think it's really important to make sure that the different assessments are balanced and that they're emphasizing students to reflect on the learning outcomes of the course as well. Um, it, when it comes to remote proctoring as well. I've also heard students kind of also have a preference um, when it comes to these two different types of proctoring as well, when it comes to um, Proctorio versus Zoom. Um, students much prefer Zoom over Proctorio um, and kind of having that similar face-to-face -face experience um, where it isn't where students aren't being recorded or that they don't have to go under any um, uh, algorithmic facial recognition um, software of any type or where it's logging their key mo keystrokes or anything. So it's kind of emulating that same face-to-face -face experience over Zoom as well, um, as well as designing the assessments to, um, to reflect their um, learning outcomes throughout the course. Yeah, Georgia. So really kind of a, a mixture of um, co-creation, student-created um, learning experiences, um, kind of metacognition reflection, as well as some Zoom proctoring rather than proctorio. That's what I'm hearing through those um, conversations. Um, let me pass the mic over back to Will. Great. Thanks. And thanks for all, all your thoughtful answers. I'm really enjoying hearing your perspectives on, on these. Um, so with the change to online learning, uh, there is also changes around how the university operates. And AMS is the undergraduate student government. Um, has, how has COVID changed um, and the shift to remote teaching changed AMS's priorities around things like student well-being, accessibility, inclusive teaching and learning, or, or other areas that you might be advocating or um, working towards policy? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. 
I think it hasn't necessarily changed the priorities, but it has also changed the landscape under which we're operating because equity, flexibility, and compassion in the applications of academic policy, these are all things that we've um, advocated for um, before the pandemic. And that I think taking advantage of the drastically different situation that I think we can also um, move forward on. So um, this, this includes making sure that the implementation of the academic concessions policy is consistent across all faculties, um, as well as being able to uh, ensure that um, that students with disabilities, they have access to the different resources, um, especially since online, there can be different barriers um, for various assistive technologies or, um, or needing further closed captioning. But I think, I think there has been a lot of opportunity for increasing um, accessibility during the pandemic. One thing that we've heard resoundingly from students is that they're really enjoying um, being able to access lecture recordings after, um, after the lecture uh, occurs synchronously um, and that they can that they can go back and review it um, or you know even if in a regular classroom or a face-to-face -face classroom maybe they might have zoned out for a little bit um, and then they can go back and review oh this is what the instructor said and this is what is going to be more relevant um, so one of the things that we're really interested is um, interested in continuing is how can we also create that flexibility when we return back to face-to-face -face or hybrid instruction as well. Um, so it, it, it's very much um, something that we're very uh, excited to leverage the momentum that we've created around accessibility um, after the pandemic um, and being able to create those resources for students and faculty as well. Great. Yeah, I love the I love the focus on equity and accessibility. One of the stats that that I use a lot in my own work and that kind of always blows my mind comes from the AMS Academic Experience Survey. Um, that I think year after year it continually finds that over thirty percent of students who are surveyed um, report that they frequently or often go without textbooks or other cor paid course materials. Um, due to the cost, so not due to the fact that they don't find those materials relevant. relevant relevant or that they're, um, uh, they're able to access them in other ways, but solely because of the cost. So how does, how does affordability impact um, a student's ability, affordability of learning materials impact a student's abilities for teaching and learning or for learning? Yeah, totally. And that is a great statistic um, that you brought up. Um, you know, we also found that this year, the average undergraduate spends 884 annually on course materials, which is a little crazy. So for an individual course, maybe the textbook might be $75, which might not be too much in the single course, but it really does add up. That $75 might be their groceries for the week. Um, so instead of focusing on their studies, um, students might have to, might then be worrying about, oh, how do they pay for their textbooks? How do they pay for the costs of tuition? How do they pay for housing? Um, so I think it's really important to be able to look at um, opportunities to make education more affordable. Um, students are often um, going without these textbooks and potentially missing parts of the reading um, to contribute as part of the discussion or that they might not feel as engaged with a generic textbook. So it's really essential to be able to um, cut across some of those barriers with, um, with the usage of um, materials such as OER um, and other, other um, ways of assessment that don't require students to purchase um, online quizzes or purchase um, online questions. So, so if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just follow up on that. And, and uh, so, so AMS has done some campaigns around like sort of identifying the cost of learning materials. Um, you've been engaged in textbook broke campaign where students post um, the amount of money that they're, they're spending. Um, but you've also really been leaders on campus in advocating um, for the use of open educational resources and, and through AMS leadership, 
Um, you've secured funding um, through the UBC OER fund to help support instructors who want to use open tech, open resources, and open resources are generally freely available and without restrictions, so um, students can access them. Um, and this was going on way before COVID began. So, so what role does OER and open resources have in online learning? Yeah, definitely. Um, OER has a huge role in um, making learning more accessible, whether it is online or in person. Um, in the midst of a global recession where a lot of students are struggling with lost income or additional costs um, and students being away from campus, um, it the best thing is that OER um, cuts across these types of barriers um, that OER can be presented in a digital format, um, that it can be remixed um, so that it can, so that parts of the, of the resource can be um, uh, exclusively extracted so that it is um, relevant to the course material at hand um, and that they're super flexible and adaptable um, so that it can be translated um, for students or that it can be remixed into a different format so that it's easily more easily readable or in a, in a different format that is more engaging. Um, so um, I think one of the really key ways is to be able to um, talk about OER um, and you know, refer people to the different resources like the OER fund. Um, and we also um, had that awesome event with the CTLT on celebrating leaders in open learning um, last semester as well. So I think celebrating the usage of OER um, and the people who use them um, is one of the best ways for um, being able to promote the usage of um, open education on um, UBC campus. Um, so I think I think one of going back to my earlier point uh, in acknowledging students as co-creators of knowledge is that it it also allows students to engage um, uh, as part of um, as part of the course as part of um, how they create their learning experience as well. So I think being able to share and collaborate um, amongst instructors and amongst students, I think it's um, really awesome. Um, I think students talk a lot about, oh, I love um, using web work um, I, or I love uh, not having to use, um, not having to pay for uh, quizzes, for example, um, and going to use like open source um, uh, materials such as um, web work um, or, um, or having a having materials across like a common uh, first year course, for example, is really, really helpful for cutting across those barriers and also supporting students um, in some of the financial and now geographic barriers that they're facing. Absolutely, and I'll, I'll just note that the Open Champions um, thing that you, you referenced I uh, was really neat and that was students nominating instructors and, and really seeing the appreciation for not having to purchase materials, um, particularly during this time. So there was a lot more uptake um, coming from students. Uh, so before I move on to audience questions, I wanted to just follow up. And, and is there anything else um, that you guys would like to share? Um, definitely. So on, on my end, I feel like I have definitely been um, surprised and appreciative of the resilience um, within our student body. Um, the many student organizations ranging from AMS clubs to our undergraduate societies, um, and even um, the student facing departments within the university, like the Center for Student Involvement, UBC Recreation, um, and UBC Orientations, to name a few. Um, I feel like from an administrative perspective, this year has made collaboration the only way um, to make like our efforts and projects possible, um, which has also really kind of boosted the relationships across campus, which I hope would kind of transcend um, across the years. Um, our student organizations have been kind of really creative and innovative in their ways to, I guess, elevate the human experience of, of their various, um, I guess, microcosms of the student body. Um, and I think there is a lot to learn um, from our student body when it comes to how um, these clubs have been able to still retain memberships um, and still create, um, I guess, events that incentivize attendance and still, um, I guess, drive the mission and mandates of their respective organizations. 
Um, so I just definitely wanted to, to shed light on the work that has been done there. Um, and just letting people know that, you know, there, there's a lot to learn from, especially from um, our students ourselves. I, I love that. I love the theme of collaboration. I think that's been um, sort of in inherent in a lot of the answers coming through, whether it's collaboration between um, student to student or student to instructor or instructor to student or amongst, the, as you're saying, the different organizations at UBC. Um, Cole, you had, you had jotted down another point that you wanted to, to talk about, about um, how does this change? How does, how does, what happens moving forward? How are things different? Yeah, and that's kind of a, you know, really interesting thing that, you know, we're starting to, it's exciting that we're getting, that we're talking about it more now, because it means that the light is, at the end of the tunnel, is coming nearer and nearer as the months go on. But, uh, you know, talking about, like, what are the lessons that, like, we've learned from this, you know, on this year of online learning and like, you know, there are going to be things that I, I'm sure most of the faculty, you know, at, at this chat know, like there's going to be things that are going to stick. Um, and, you know, it's sort of like figuring out like, what are those things that we're going to be keeping around for, you know, like what are going to be the staples of, you know, um, post-secondary education for the next, you know, three decades, you know, that came out of this pandemic, um, you know, uh, as, I have the privilege of sitting as the chair of the Academic Building Needs Committee on the Senate. You know, that's something that, you know, we're talking about more and more each month we meet is, you know, what does hybridized learning look like? You know, when we're talking about lecture capture technology in classrooms, um, you know, how will faculty sort of use that tech to, um, you know, influence how they design their course material? You know, are we, because I don't think we're going to, you know, go back to the same thing if everything's back in person, you know, are we going to have options for people to attend their lectures remotely if they can't make it in person because it's going to be broadcast via Zoom or lecture capture? Um, you know, what does assessment look like moving forward? I know there's been a lot of debates around, um, you know, uh, invasive invigilation software um, and how, you know, the negative uh, impact it has on students, but, you know, like, are we able to find ethical ways of assessing students remotely moving forward? Does it change how um, we do that? You know, does it change how um, we define, you know, how to ensure that content's accessible to students asynchronously? I mean, what expectations are for that? So I think it's like, you know, really interesting, you know, to start having these conversations because we don't really know what that answer is yet. Um, but I, I would definitely encourage faculty to, you know, make sure that they're communicating with, you know, their departments um, and their faculties as well on like what's been working and, you know, to make sure that you're engaged when, you know, those um, dean's offices eventually come to their faculty and, and ask, uh, you know, what is the next, you know, five years going to look like and what is our post pandemic recovery going to look like. So, uh, you know, I think that like there's a lot of lessons that we can take away from this 18 months of uh, craziness that we've all experienced, but uh, it's definitely an exciting time to be in, in the post-secondary sector. And, uh, um, you know, I'm really excited to see how, you know, UBC can sort of continue to um, continue to build uh, great educational programming for its students that, you know, continues to be world-class. Right. And, and I just want to say, again, we appreciate you guys taking time to, to discuss these things and helping us um, I think these conversations about what the future looks like are, will be ongoing forever. And it's, it's great to have your voices um, here today to talk about that. Uh, so now we're going to, I'm going to go ahead and, and start taking some questions from the audience. And I'll just ask the audience um, to put their hands up and then we'll call on them. Uh, there were a couple of questions in the chat. And I'm going to go ahead and start uh, with the one I have in front of me, uh, which comes from Lucy. And she asks, are there any good ways to emphasize how important peer-to-peer -peer connections are so that students... Um, that disappear from breakout rooms might consider staying and participating. And, and Joanne um, has a sort of a similar follow-up to that, um, examples of effective, effectively engaging in peer-to-peer -peer learning. So what, what advice or what, what thoughts do you have on how to make peer-to-peer -peer learning work really well? Kayla, do you wanna? Um, yeah, something simple, I guess that's worked pretty well for me is uh, when we're in a breakout room, we're, we're there for a purpose and we have to get something done. Per se, and then our, our the instructor or the TA, uh, you know, often notes that they're going to stop by at any moment. 
Um, they stop by so that we're expecting that, you know, that's something I experienced in my class yesterday, actually, where one of us wanted to leave and then someone in the group reminded the group that, oh, the instructor is going to be stopping by in 20 minutes. So we should stick around and, and, you know, be ready with something to say. So that ended up with us just talking about it and collaborating uh, in order to be able to uh, interact with our instructor when they stop by. And that's something my instructor does every single time when I break up room is everyone knows that either the instructor or the TA will eventually drop by. So then you are kind of forced, but in a good way to actually stick, stick around and get some work done. Yeah, just to add in there, I, I also do believe kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning is, is more effective when kind of students are more kind of used to it. Um, so I do believe that, you know, in, in the, you know, classes where, you know, they're only just implementing things like these, chances are students may not already be kind of comfortable or used to it and hence um, would think it's, it's much easier to just like, you know, remove themselves from it. But I do believe that if, you know, peer-to-peer -peer learning is encouraged, like right from the beginning, you know, from their first year in university throughout all their courses, um, that would definitely translate into kind of more engagement within the classroom space. Um, and I think that would definitely benefit a lot of learning um, across the board. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree. Um, I think one of the other ways that I've seen is really helpful is like creating different pathways, I guess, or like um, lowering the barriers for students to participate. So if we are, if students are in a breakout room and we're requiring students to have their cameras turned on, for example, or to speak verbally, could we look at other ways of um, oh, you can, it's okay if you don't want to turn on your camera or speak verbally. Um, you can also um, speak through um, text chat or you can speak or you can contribute through like the, um, through the whiteboard function on Zoom, for example, and kind of looking at the different ways that students can also um, contribute in a way that they feel comfortable with. Because one of the reasons that a lot of students I've heard um, might want to leave a, a breakout room um, might be to might be because oh it's it's very panic inducing um, as well so what are the different mechanisms to kind of lower those barriers um, in, to participation as well perfect thank you I, I, I we have a couple more questions in the chat and I'm just going to go ahead and go through this if, if you put this question in the chat please feel free to turn off your mic and and uh, clarify it if I don't have it right but Leticia asks um, do you think different technology or tools would help resolve some of the issues with online learning or is it more about encouraging implementation of effective course design with the current tools that we have um personally I, I do think it's a uh... It's, it's a heavy mix of both um, and kind of where we are, technology is really, really having a, a stronger presence in our um, like education. Um, so yes, I do think that, you know, there are evolving technologies that make learning and assessment much easier and equitable, which um, we, we should be exploring. Um, but that also comes with, um, I guess, the comfort of the educators themselves being, um, I guess, Confident with these various technologies um, and being able to, you know, utilize the technologies to the best of their abilities. Because as of now, um, you know, in, in the learning space, obviously it's, it's really no one's fault, um, but chances are the students are probably more equipped at kind of running online lectures than the professors themselves. Um, this is probably just because of just how kind of the, you know, training and kind of education of just everyone has been thus far. Um, so I, I do think there is a lot of room for kind of more technology adaptation when it comes to our um, kind of learning environment. Um, and this comes with, you know, educators being comfortable um, to take up these additional, um, I guess, challenges or milestones when it comes to making sure that their material um, is still per their standards, but also catered to meet um, the experiences and the individuals who they are educating. I think for uh, for me, I, I think that you know that the answer to that question leans more towards course design because I feel like you know, like Sylvester mentioned, I, I feel like you know the solutions that we're mostly using for lectures and engaging right now, like with Zoom, is um, you know it's 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 more than adequate. 
And, uh, and, I, and I agree that I, I think that, you know, with, you'll see with most students are, are mostly technologically uh, quite adept. So you know, I, I think that that solution's working well as far as just like with the bases. Um, but, but I think like when we're talking about course design and like how we can make that better, um, I think that there is also room though to, you know, when we're talking about how we're, you know, administering assignments to students and, um, you know, how they're engaging with each other, you know, when there are innovative technologies that come up, you know, how can we integrate those innovative technologies in the course design to like, you know, further learning. So, you know, I, I think that like the, for me, I don't think that it's really the technology that's really the, the huge thing. I think it's more like, you know, how does, how does the technology impact the course design? Because at the end of the day, the course design is what's gonna, you know, contribute most significantly to the learning of students. Um, and I know there's a lot of students that when they're, when they're, when they're uh, professors are, you know, introducing like a, you know, really cool way of engaging or they're using cool software or things like that to do work. I, I, I know that we've definitely heard positive feedback on that. And unfortunately I don't have an example to give you right now, but I know that like, you know, there's um, a, lot of, a lot of cool things that um, we've definitely heard from the community that have been done uh, that, you know, give students different, <coughs> excuse me, give students different ways on how to engage with course material. So maybe as a, a follow-up, Seth asks, um, in terms of course design, is there, do you have perspectives on the preference between synchronous live recorded lectures versus asynchronous lectures? Um, he said, he's wondering one of the, if one of these formats is preferred by students. And with heavier asynchronous approach, it seems that more of the synchronized time could be spent in direct engagement, uh, discussion, et cetera. I mean, I, I guess I can share kind of my personal experience with synchronous and a, asynchronous classes or lectures. Uh, uh, I think I think it's very important to ensure the um, the attendance of students in, in in class. And something that you know you often lose with asynchronous lectures is, uh, at least for myself, is you know I, I find myself less motivated to watch it later than during a scheduled time when my the entire class is there. Obviously, time difference and all these things uh, create barriers to that but uh, i think uh, you know something interesting i've seen is it's kind of a mix between the two where for the first section of the class you have a synchronous lecture that's also recorded and available for students that aren't able to make the make it to the lecture that they can watch it later on but um, the, the rest of the class or most of the, the class is focused on actual engagement with, uh, with, the, with the class and peer-to-peer -peer learning, which I think goes a long way. So a, a, split, a split between the two where, where students have content that they will look at at their own time or watch a lecture and then join the class and then and get a little bit more out, out of that lecture, which is a synchronous one. And then you spend the rest of the class time um, either in conversation with your instructor or your peers. Um, and I think just finding the balance between the two and ensuring that ensuring that those barriers to education are still addressed is this is important. So it's all about finding a balance to me at least. Yeah, I, I don't think that there's any real preference because it's very much tailored to the individual student um, from, just from like what we've heard. Um, there's definitely the mix. I think overwhelmingly students do really enjoy having the option there available. Um, I know personally um, I, I started out like oh I can I, I bet I work much better at night, for example, and I love I love watching my lectures at night, but then I realized oh I also I should also do some of the participation or use the time that I have in um, within the lecture to be able to ask questions. Um, and so I think being able to use that mix of both so that there is the opportunity to um, to have like um, the synchronous part be more heavily focused on um, you know, engagement and discussion, but still having that option open for students is really useful. So I, I think it really depends on the individual students and how they how they prefer to engage as well. Perfect. So I think we have time for one more quick question, which is in the chat. How would you, and it comes from Bruce, how would you evaluate the amount of time you're putting into courses now compared to pre-COVID? Yeah, I think that's a that's a 
It's a really tough question because I think it, it really depends. Um, I think everyone would have their own kind of input to this. But from, from my experience, um, I have realized that I am spending kind of less time um, when it comes to, you know, you know, being in the mindset to, to study or, you know, consume whatever materials being presented to me. However, within that time, I do get more quality out of that. Um, because, you know, gone are the days where I am, you know, rushing from my apartment, trying to run to class. And, you know, I get to class all, you know, tired, trying to pay attention. The teacher is going on and on. There are people around me distracting me. Um, but now I am at home. I have asynchronous lectures or synchronous lectures. Um, I can watch them over. Um, if I have an assignment coming up, um, I know where to get the material. Um, so I, I do believe it's 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 a bit of both. Um, but from my experience, um, I, I am definitely spending kind of less time compared to before. Um, and I am getting more value from the less time I'm spending. Um, but also, I also do believe that, you know, sometimes like educators kind of take advantage of the idea that students may have more time on their hands and try to give them more things to do online. And that really doesn't work either. Um, if, I, if I can just uh, quickly jump in here, I think, uh, it, it, for example, if you take a student that's, uh, that typically would commute all the way from Surrey to UBC five days of the week, they're spending about two to three hours in total in transit time alone. Um, and I think, you know, the online learning environment has completely stripped that away from them and given them that extra three to four hours every day to spend uh, on their learning or something else that they can do. And that's something that really stood out to me when I speak to my peer. I'm, I'm originally from Surrey. So when I speak to my, my friends from Surrey that, you know, typically spend hours and hours commuting here back and forth. And another thing is students that are uh, working at the same time. I mean, for me, for example, obviously me and my fellow executives, we work full time and a lot of us are taking in courses at the same time. For example, I have a class at three o'clock. So right after this call, I can just stick in my, stay in my office, prepare for my class and jump straight into that class. And I've also engaged with a few students in my classes who were telling me that because of this online learning environment, they're able to balance uh, work and school much better than back when they had to, you know, transit all the way to school, for example. So I think I think that's an interesting perspective to keep in mind as well of students that uh, need to work or, or travel from a farther distance and the, the the extra time that they have on their hands, whether it's to spend it on school or even to spend it on themselves. You know, at the end of the day, if you have three hours to spend time reading and taking better care of yourself, you're probably going to end up learning more in that classroom environment as well. So online learning has significant benefits, in my opinion, that I think we should stick around to stick around with. Perfect. And with that note, I will just note we are out of time. And I do really extremely want to thank Caleb, Georgia, Cole, and Sylvester for taking time out of their extremely busy schedules. At least one of these panelists was on another panel today um, and they all have classes and they all work full time. So I really um, can say on behalf of Jens and myself that we really do appreciate your time. I think these conversations are fascinating, could go on for hours, um, but I really appreciate your work and, and just wanna say thanks again for, for being part of it.